Welcome to Louisiana LTAP's flagger setup video. As a flagger at a construction, maintenance, or utility work zone, or for incident management, the safety of the motoring public is in your hands. Drivers and pedestrians look to you for warnings and guidance. They expect clear and timely instructions with minimum delay and inconvenience. To the work crew, you represent their first line of defense. The workers rely on you for their personal safety and to keep traffic out of their way so the work can be completed. The following tips were gathered recognizing the importance of you, the flagger. These tips will help you to do the best job possible while complying with state and federal requirements. The purpose of this exercise is to illustrate proper setup procedures for a one-lane, two-way traffic control layout on a typical local road, to demonstrate flagger control for several scenarios with this setup, Identify techniques for earning the motorist respect and keeping workers safe during a flagging operation. And to illustrate the proper takedown process for a one-lane, two-way traffic control. In order to have a safe and efficient work zone set up, it should be PRIMO. Yes, we love acronyms. P-R-I-M-O. In order to have a PRIMO work zone, you should perform the following steps before undertaking the work itself. Plan your work, review the MUTCD, inventory your devices, measure the site, and organize your crew. Now we'll explain what's involved in each step. First, plan the work. This typical picture comes from the MUTCD. It shows the four parts of a work zone common to all operations. As you can see, the actual workspace is only part of the work zone. Planning your work includes making room for an advance warning area where the warning signs will be posted, a transition area where traffic will be redirected out of its normal path, an activity area which includes the workspace, taking into account the need for delivery and staging of materials, parking of equipment, and buffer spaces, and the termination area where traffic will be returned to its normal path after passing the activity area. While the actual workspace will be dictated by the work to be done, the other areas may need to be adjusted based on the location and duration of the work, considering any limiting factors such as driveways or site obstructions, and the need to perform work in several phases. You may have to come back to your plan once you've looked at the later steps and make some adjustments. The next step for a Primo work zone is to review the MUTCD. Look for a typical application that matches as closely as possible the type of work you are planning. State versions of the manual may have more specific guidance for your situation. Examples are the Work Zone Safety Guidelines Flipbook from North Carolina that we use in our workshop or the Louisiana Maintenance Traffic Control Handbook. These sources are based on the MUTCD and provide typical application examples just like the MUTCD does. So our review of the manual reveals that typical application 10 from part 6 shows the setup for a lane closure on a two-lane road using two flaggers. Just what we want. Make sure to read the notes that go with the typical. That will make it easier to adapt the typical to your particular situation. At this point in developing your Primo plan, you will need to think about the number and type of signs required. Using tables based on the MUTCD and assuming a low-speed, low-volume roadway, one sign on each approach at a minimum of 100 feet from the taper should be sufficient. That would be the A distance on the typical application. For higher speeds and volumes, additional warning signs such as one lane road ahead and road work ahead may be used, added at the B and C distances respectively. It can be helpful to go ahead and draw up a project-specific traffic control plan based on what you've adapted from your review of the MUTCD. Based on the requirement to close one lane of a two-way roadway, we have determined that a two-flagger situation will be needed. Because this is a low-speed, low-volume local road, we have determined that a single warning sign on each approach is sufficient as a minimum. Likewise, we will use a 50-foot transition taper to close the lane and a 50-foot termination taper downstream of the closed lane to return traffic to its normal path. Now, we inventory the devices needed for our Primo work zone. 
Use the traffic control plan to count the devices and double check your work. You don't want to leave some needed devices back at the shop and have to go back, and you definitely don't want to do without them. The minimum inventory of devices is listed here, along with some optional equipment to take along. Situations can change and it never hurts to bring along more than you need, just in case. Required would be two flagger symbol signs, one for each approach, 12 to 16 cones, two stop slow paddles, and two flaggers equipped with the proper personal protective equipment, radios, and so forth. Optional or additional equipment may include additional advance warning signs, additional stop slow paddle for side street approaches, an additional flagger, barricades, along with end road work signs. Now it's time to measure the parts of the work zone. Depending on the length of the work zone, you can use tape measure, measuring wheel, calibrated step off, or even a vehicle with a digital odometer. Some vehicle mounted distance measuring instruments, called DMIs, can measure feet, but at a minimum you want to measure one one thousandth of a mile, which will be a little over five feet. That's close enough. So how do we actually measure? First, identify your work site. How much room do you need for the activity area? Included in the active workspace would be excavation or repair area, parking space for work vehicles and equipment, maneuvering space for vehicles loading or unloading. Generally, these staging areas should be downstream of the approach in the lane to be closed. Also think about the need for a buffer space. Though optional, it is an extra measure that can keep you safe. For a two-way roadway, buffers can be in both directions, but in most cases, the most critical buffer is in the closed lane. The buffer space will be a function of the stopping distance from the prevailing speed of the roadway and can be obtained from Table 6C-2 in the MUTCD or tables in other work zone guidelines documents. In our example, less than 35 miles per hour, accommodation of the optional buffer space would be up to 250 feet. However, we're going to use a very short buffer in order to keep the work area short so the flaggers can see each other. A shorter buffer also reduces interference with driveways and other features that might make traffic control more difficult. Once you've identified the location and length of the activity area, including the need for a buffer space, go ahead and measure the distances and mark them with cones or paint. Next, mark out distance for the flagger taper on the approach end of the lane to be closed, in the transition area, and the downstream taper beyond the activity area in the termination area. For our example, the flagger taper will be 50 feet long with six cones spaced 10 feet apart. Likewise, the downstream or termination taper will be 50 feet with six cones placed 10 feet apart. For longer activity area buffer spaces and tapers, you may need to use a vehicle with an odometer that can measure feet or one thousandths of a mile at least. All of these steps can be done before the crew shows up to do the work, even the day before, saving lots of time. However, a vehicle with flashing lights should be used as a minimum to warn traffic of any work taking place on the shoulder. The final step in planning a Primo work zone is to organize your crew. This can take place before you leave the yard or in a safe location off the roadside. Make sure everyone on the job site understands the traffic control plan before stepping out into the roadway. Get your law enforcement officers in on the meeting as well. Discuss specific assignments for setting out cones, erecting signs, and flagging. Go over safety procedures for working in or near traffic. Answer any questions. The better informed everyone is before you get out into the roadway, the quicker and more efficient your setup will go, and everyone will be safer. So that's the Primo approach. Now let's get some devices out so we can start the work. We've planned our activity area, reviewed the manual for a traffic control scheme, inventoried our devices, measured the site, and organized the crew. It's time to put out the signs. These are the first devices to be deployed and the last to be removed. If you haven't already done so, mark out distance for the flagger taper on the approach end of the lane to be closed in the transition area and the downstream taper beyond the activity area in the termination area. For our example, the flagger taper will be 50 feet long with six cones spaced 10 feet apart. 
Likewise, the downstream or termination taper will be 50 feet with six cones placed 10 feet apart. You can go ahead and line up the cones along the shoulder of the road now if you like, but be careful that any work along the shoulder must be marked with a vehicle with a flashing light at a minimum. And always walk along the shoulder facing traffic. So a few more words on measuring. There are a number of ways to get the right distances. For higher speed roadways, signing distances will be longer, in many cases too long to walk safely. But in our case, we can walk. If you don't have measuring devices, you can estimate the distance using the center line stripes, which are 10 feet long and 40 feet on center. So two skip lines plus the 30 foot space in between will give you an accurate 50 foot measurement. If there are no skip lines, pacing works pretty well if you've had a little practice. Figure on a three foot stride plus another foot about the length of your shoe to get the 10 foot spacing for the cones. Placement of warning signs. Measuring from the end of the activity area, measure the downstream taper, 50 feet, and mark with a cone, then measure the distance to the warning sign at 100 feet from the taper. Mark with a cone or spray paint. Cross to the opposite side of the roadway and place the warning sign. If you're not using a vehicle, walk against traffic when measuring and placing your signs. Placement of the sign on a portable folding stand is a fairly quick operation and roll-up signs for daytime use are easy to handle. If you have multiple signs, set them up in the direction of traffic. The sign closest to the work will be the flag or symbol sign, regardless of the number of warning signs used. Proceed to the flagging location, in this case 100 feet from the sign. Drop off the flagger and keep him at the ready. The flagger may go ahead and display the slow paddle, staying on the shoulder. This flagger controls the open lane, that is, the lane not affected by the actual road work. Moving past the activity area, go ahead and measure the transition area for the closed lane and then the warning sign distance, in this case 50 and 100 feet respectively. Recheck the warning distance by moving up to the beginning of the transition area. Post the flagger and unload the rest of the cones if necessary. If the distances are short, again, you may measure by walking down the shoulder against traffic to place the sign, but it is always a good idea to cross the road on the way back so you will always be facing traffic. Before any work vehicle enters the roadway, flaggers begin flagging traffic. With all traffic stopped, move the cones from the shoulder into the lane to be closed. Start with the first and last cones of the taper, then fill in the remaining cones, being sure to maintain the pre-measured distances. While you're at it, and while you have all traffic stopped, go ahead and add some cones from the end of the taper to the end of the activity area along or adjacent to the center line. Straight tapers are essential for providing maximum visibility to approaching motorists and to earn the motorist's respect. A straight taper tells the motorist that you mean business and you expect them to follow your directions. To get a straight taper, with traffic still stopped, have one worker stand on the shoulder 10 feet or more beyond the first cone and sight down the taper line to the last cone. One or more workers then move the remaining cones into line following the direction of the first worker to get them straight. If you try to sight a straight line from inside the taper, it will never be straight. This operation should take less than 30 seconds for a six cone taper, but it's worth it to get a good looking taper. Do the same for the downstream taper, positioning the first and last cones, followed by the rest of the cones, and straighten the taper as before. For the downstream taper, the person directing will be on the shoulder on the downstream end of the taper looking back towards the activity area. Again, traffic should be stopped in both directions at this point to keep the workers safe. If you haven't done so, cones should connect the two tapers along the center line. These are spaced a maximum of two times the taper spacing, so in our case, two times 10 feet equals 20 feet. If you have problems with vehicles trying to cut into the workspace, you can always reduce the spacing by adding a few more cones. So here's our completed setup. Warning signs, minimum one per approach, two flaggers, one on each approach, six cones in each taper, nominally 10 feet apart for a 50 foot taper, 
additional cones to outline the activity area at no more than 20 feet apart, and additional signs depending on speed and traffic volume. Now the work vehicles can move into the activity area and set up to do the work. For a relatively short work zone setup with a conscientious crew, the entire setup should be accomplished within about 10 minutes. If you plan to be out at the same location on multiple work shifts, go ahead and mark the cone locations with paint to speed up the installation process on the next shift. This would include temporarily halting the work due to a lunch break or passing inclement weather. Whenever the flagger symbol sign is used, it must be promptly removed, covered, or turned to face away from the roadway as soon as the flagger leaves his or her station. The responsibility of placing and removing the flagger symbol sign should be assigned to a specific person in the work crew. Now the flaggers alternate stopping traffic and they try to maintain a smooth traffic flow. At this point, the supervisor should review the setup and actually drive through the work zone in both directions to check flagger positioning, visibility of signs, and general traffic flow. If motorists are making sudden maneuvers or stops, or appear to be confused, then some adjustments may be needed. The flagger controlling the closed lane should be stationed at the beginning of or just ahead of the taper. While on duty as a flagger, you must be on your feet facing oncoming traffic. Always stand in a highly visible location away from the work activity, parked vehicles, machinery, or anything which might hide you from approaching drivers or block your escape route. This is what we call giving yourself an out. Also be careful not to stand in shadows and never stand directly in the path of an approaching vehicle. Do not stand in a travel lane being used by traffic. Approaching traffic must be able to see you in plenty of time to react safely. Generally, flagger stations should be located in advance of the work site at the beginning of the taper. However, lines of sight, the speed and volume of approaching traffic, road conditions, and the type of work being done should be considered to determine the best location. To make the warning signs more effective, it is always a good idea to have the signs, the flagger, and the taper in full view of approaching traffic. In this way, the devices reinforce each other and improve compliance by the drivers. Now let's look at more detail on the flagger's task. The flaggers begin directing traffic in turn. The flagger controlling the closed lane is usually in charge, determining who goes first. To stop traffic, hold the stop paddle sign with your right hand, erect and away from your body. Look directly at the approaching driver. With your free arm upraised in the halt position, bring the first approaching vehicle to a full stop. Do not wave the paddle. Never stand in the path of an approaching vehicle and never turn your back on traffic. Also, since a motorist requires considerable time to see and understand your signals, make clear and precise movements. To release traffic while standing to the front and to the right of stopped traffic, turn the slow side of the sign paddle to face traffic. With your free arm, signal the driver to proceed. Do not wave or rock the paddle. Make eye contact and direct drivers individually into the open lane. Again, clear and precise movements will earn the driver's respect and ensure compliance with your directions. Continue to hold the paddle upright with your right hand. Once all the traffic on an approach is passed, turn the paddle to stop and wait for the next vehicle. Signal the other flagger that the approach is now clear. Walkie-talkies or radios are sometimes used on construction sites for flaggers who are far apart. It is helpful for a distant flagger to be in radio contact with the work crew supervisor. The flagger and foreman can share information about traffic conditions, work progress, and any special problems that arise. For locations with very low traffic volume and good visibility from both approaches, a single flagger operation is possible. All devices are set up as for the two flagger operation but a single flagger is stationed on the shoulder of the road on the side opposite from the work. This ensures the best visibility of the flagger for traffic approaching from either direction. The motions of the flagger are similar to the two flagger operation except that the flagger is allowed to change hands to direct traffic approaching from right or left. The flagger should stand on the shoulder of the road facing the roadway and hold the paddle in either hand always checking for traffic approaching from the opposite direction.
Starting with the slow paddle facing the open lane, motion traffic through, checking to ensure that drivers in the closed lane remain stopped. When the open lane traffic is clear, rotate the paddle and immediately turn to face the waiting traffic in the closed lane. Motion them through using the standard directions, making eye contact. As the traffic proceeds, check the opposite approach frequently for oncoming vehicles. If one is approaching, make sure to use your free hand to signal them to stop. It is best to face the activity area at right angles to the roadway so that a quick glance to the right or left will allow you to verify that traffic is following your directions. When no traffic is approaching, leave the slow paddle facing the open lane and pay particular attention to traffic approaching in the closed lane, directing them to stop if necessary. Only allow them to proceed without stopping if you are absolutely certain that no traffic will be approaching from the other direction in the open lane. If traffic begins to build up or is tempted to move behind your back, then it is time to call a second flagger to help control the situation. Even if you are the only flagger, having radio contact with the work crew supervisor will allow you to concentrate on your flagging. The overwhelming advantage of the two flagger setup is the ability to control both approaches with improved visibility and confidence. If part of the operation requires it, all traffic can be stopped for brief periods. If a traffic control device gets displaced, all traffic can be stopped until it gets corrected. And if an emergency vehicle needs to get through, the emergency vehicle can then proceed through the work zone, bypassing all the stopped vehicles in both directions. Often the presence of a driveway or minor street entrance within the work area cannot be avoided. If the entrance cannot be blocked off and traffic diverted to another roadway, then the best solution is to post a third flagger. By communicating the presence of driveway traffic to the lead flagger, all traffic can be stopped on both approaches of the main roadway in order to allow the driveway traffic to proceed. Note that in this scenario, the drivers can go either direction from the driveway. Attempts to direct the vehicles to turn one way or the other should be avoided. Remember that as a flagger, you only command the stopping and releasing of traffic, not the direction of turns or other complex maneuvers. The same applies to construction vehicles. You may stop roadway traffic to allow construction vehicles to maneuver, but it is not your job to direct them. Additional spotters may be used to help those vehicles to maneuver but the flagger's job is to control the road traffic only. And remember to stay out of the roadway and out of the path of all approaching vehicles. When the work is finished or temporarily suspended, removal of the work zone setup is done in the reverse order of installing it. First, take all work equipment and materials out of the road while continuing to flag traffic. Next, Stop all traffic while cones are removed out of the roadway. First, the termination taper, then the cones around the work area, and finally, the lane closure or transition taper. Flaggers can then be relieved and signs removed last of all. This same procedure applies if flagging operations are temporarily suspended. Signs should not be left standing if flaggers are not actively controlling traffic. Following standard flagging procedures, conducting yourself in a professional manner at all times, and giving yourself an out will help to ensure a safe work zone for workers, road users, and for you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us at Louisiana LTAP. Thanks for watching and stay safe out there.